Okay, today's presenter is Gleb Sipersky, CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. He specializes in helping forward-thinking leaders avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. He is the author of Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, and The Blind Spots Between Us, how to overcome unconscious cognitive bias and build better relationships. His latest book is Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. Uh, okay, Gleb, it's all yours. Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate that warm introduction, Dirk. And let's talk about how you as quality professionals can make sure that you don't ignore serious risks in the post-COVID world, post-pandemic recovery. Hopefully, the Delta surge won't cause too much of a problem for us, but we are maybe not in such a recovery as we were planning to be. But this is one of those risks we want to be aware of and we want to face head on and not be blinded to. And also what you can do about it, of course, to make sure that you recognize those risks, but also so that you help others recognize those risks, your colleagues, leaders in your company, whatever. So make sure that they recognize these risks and not in the typical ways that we go about them, which is to argue about them and present facts, which unfortunately doesn't work very well. So let's talk about what we can do to address these risks. And first, I want to talk about judgment, how you make decisions about risks. We are told to be confident. That's a really important quality, be confident. That's something that we're told about when we make our judgments, make our judgments about quality, make our judgments about anything. So let's talk about confidence as a quality. And I want to first go away from quality decision-making, go away from decision-making about work and talk about driving skills. Now, when you think about your driving skills, would you say you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? Top half or bottom half? So there's gonna be a poll where you can vote on this. Do you think you are in the top half or bottom half of all drivers? Go ahead, please go ahead and vote. I'll see about three quarters participate. I'll give five more seconds for those who can't make up their mind, whether they're in the top half or bottom half. All right, so we see that of all the people here, 80% are in the top half and 20% are in the bottom half, 80% and 20%. Now, of course, we know by definition that it should be 50%. 50% of people are in the top half full drivers. 50% of people are in the top bottom half full drivers. 80% and 20% doesn't sound like 50% and 50% doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is a typical judgment error that we make about the kind of risks that we are facing and not facing. We tend to overstate our abilities in driving and all other areas. I mean, there's a reason there's so many car crashes in American roads because people tend to exaggerate their driving ability and think, oh yes, I can make that turn. Oh, oh yes, I can cut in front of that guy. You know, <laughs> that is not a good idea. And we should all be a little bit more defensive drivers than we tend to be and a little bit less confident about our driving abilities. And that's one of the big problems that we face in dealing with risks. You face and everyone else faces, and I face, <laughs> that we tend to over exaggerate how good we are at everything. We are overconfident. That is the, called the overconfidence bias. It's one of many dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that Dirk mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. We tend to be way too confident in making our judgments. We don't gather enough information for making judgments and we tend to be way too confident once we make the judgment and once we make a decision, don't change our mind even though evidence indicates we should change our mind. In fact, there's a studies showing that when people say they're 100% confident about something, you'd bet the farm, you'd bet the company, you'd bet your career, people are right only about 80% of the time. 80% of the time, they would lose the farm, they would lose the company, they would lose their career. That is not a good decision. And that's something that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about risks in the post-pandemic recovery and risks making in general, risk evaluation in general. We don't tend to evaluate risks well. We tend to be overconfident. And that goes especially for people who have more experience and more authority. 
So let's say you've been in the, you know, there are people in the quality field who have been in it for a year, two years, three years. And there are people who have been in it for 10 years, for 20 years. People with more experience and authority tend to be more overconfident than people who are junior in the field. That's the, what the research shows, shows. So I'll give you an example from doctors. There was a study comparing doctors and who were senior, who spent many, many years out of medical school, and those who just came out of medical school. And they were given a case study to evaluate and then make a recommendation for the right course of medication. Well, it turns out that the senior doctors and the junior doctors got the evaluation of the disease right and the prescription of medication about, about the same rate. So they were about as good at evaluating. But the senior doctors were much more confident in their diagnosis, even though they, they were not better than the junior doctors. So that's what comes with seniority. And that's kind of understandable when you think about it. Senior doctors have a lot more experience, but their knowledge is much less fresh from medical school. Whereas junior doctors, they just have much more updated knowledge from medical school. The same may well apply to people in the quality field. People who just had a lot of years in the quality field may feel that, oh, I'm experienced, I have a lot of authority, therefore my judgment is going to be much better. But in times of disruption, in times of change, which was what we're talking about in the post-pandemic recovery, their judgment may not be better than people who are junior in the field and who may have more fresh knowledge for coming out of degrees and so on. So that's something to really be think about. And people who tend to be more senior tend to be more stuck in their judgments and not recognizing the change that may be coming up. So that is something that we really need to be cognizant of. We deny the risks. We deny all sorts of risks, including quality professionals and all sorts of leaders really often. So let's talk about top level leadership. Now that I've been talking about quality, we're quality leaders. We're talking about top level leaders at the company. There was a study of 286 organizations of various sorts that fired their top leaders. So they fired their top leaders, and we're talking here about board members who were asked, why did you fire your top leaders? Well, of the reasons that they were fired, 23% of board members cited denying negative facts, denying negative reality about risks. That was the reason why top leaders were fired. So denying negative reality, denying facts about the situation is what caused these top leaders to be fired. This denialism happens all the time at all sorts of organizational levels, not simply at the top levels. So denialism is, this risk denialism is a big, big, serious issue. Now, I'm going to ask you whether that's something you ever observe in your company or in other companies. Were you ever surprised when you observe top leaders denying significant risks? Is that something that happened to you? Please go ahead and vote in the poll. Were you ever surprised when you saw top leaders denying significant risks? About two thirds of the people participated. Let's give just about 10 seconds because not all participated for people to make up their minds, make their voices heard. And remember, you can chat your question anytime. I will be answering them at the end. But if you have questions as we go along, please chat them. All right, so we see that over two thirds of you, over two thirds of you felt surprised when top leaders denied negative risk, denied significant risks. So we see that risk, risk denialism, you've observed, you've seen it, and you were surprised by it. And that's indicative of, well, yeah, when I talk to quality professionals, they tell me this pretty frequently, whether you're a quality professional and the quality leader of your organization, with, of your division, of your business unit is denying risks, or more frequently what I hear is that top leaders are denying risks about quality or other areas of the company. That's a big, serious issue that you need to be aware of. Now, what's going on here? Why do we deny these risks? Why do top leaders deny these risks? Why do we as individuals deny such risks? This denialism, again, happens at all levels, including within the quality field. What happens? Why? Negative information, risks, feel bad. It feels bad. It feels bad in our gut to accept these risks. It's 
we flinch away from it. We see this negative information and we flinch away from it, especially for quality professionals. What I tend to see is flinching away from risks around people. Quality professionals do quite well with risks around systems and processes, technical stuff, operations, but the risks around people where you observe a person or people or teams systematically making risky decisions and not really not really doing the right things, quality professionals tend to not be well equipped in dealing with people risks, people problems, people quality issues. And they tend to flinch away from that and focus more on systemic process issues rather than get into a conflictual situation, which might be very well necessary for their job as quality professionals to ensure quality around people risks. It's, we don't like to feel bad. Nobody likes to feel bad about themselves. We don't like to feel that we are not making the good decisions, that there are significant risks, and it takes real emotional intelligence to accept this. So we have to overcome our instincts. We have to overcome our intuitions, and we have to develop a skill of welcoming this negative information. Now, why, what's up with our instincts? Why do we have to overcome them? Well, here's the nature of these cognitive biases. They stem from these dangerous judgment, of the, these dangerous judgment errors stem from our evolutionary background. So we didn't evolve our emotions, our intuitions, our gut reactions. They didn't evolve for the modern environment. They evolved for the savannah environment when we were lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And we had to have that fight or flight response. So the fight or flight response you might have heard of it as a saber-toothed tiger response. You'd have to jump at 100 shadows to get away from one saber-toothed tiger. That flight or flight response, fight or flight response, causes us to jump to conclusions and deny risks very often because we don't feel good about, you know, we, you have to, in that sort of situation, the savannah situation, you have to make a very quick judgment. And that means denying all sorts of risks in order to go forward. In the modern environment, you know, there are many, many less saber-toothed tigers, those sorts of in quick decisions that you have to make for your sake of your survival. But we tend to make the same decisions that way. And the tribalism that we talked about causes us to deny risks around people because in the savannah environment, it was very important for us to be tribal, meaning for us to be very oriented toward those who are part of our tribe. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. So that it cause, still causes us to be very uh, tense and filled with the internal conflicts about bringing up people issues, people risks. And so quality professionals generally don't do good at that. They tend to let this tribalism overcome the real quality needs from addressing issues in operations and processes and engineering. I've seen this way too often. So this is something for you to be aware of. So this overcoming our instincts, you need to be aware of your instincts, your, your intuitions, your emotions. And that's where emotional intelligence comes in. And, some, and then you need to be able to develop the skill of welcoming negative information, saying, okay, you know, this is actually a serious risk. And it comes because these people are making these systematically bad choices and they are denying these risks. So we need to address this sort of risk. That's the kind of a skill this process, this mental process that quality professionals need to develop. And here is the problem. So the cognitive biases I talked about, the specific cognitive bias here that's really relevant is called the ostrich effect. The ostrich effect, it's kind of, it's denying negative reality about the situation. You probably heard the myth of an ostrich burying its head in the sand to get away from threats. It, it's mythical, it's not <laughs> real, but this is what the ostrich effect was named after by the cognitive neuroscientists, behavioral economists who discovered it. So the ostrich effect, you need to manage this within yourself, which is very tempting again, to deny negative information, to deny risks, especially around people, and you need to manage it in others. So you need to manage it within yourself and within others. And of course, related cognitive bias risks. So this is something that we need to be aware of. Another cognitive bias risk that is really important here is called the confirmation bias, and Dirk mentioned that. We tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. That feeds into the ostrich effects, this denial of reality. So there are a number of cognitive biases here, and I'll send you some resources about them after the presentation. So you can opt into getting those resources about these cognitive biases, about risk denialism, and what to do about them. 
So this, the ostrich effect is something that is really important for you to know. And so that's well, what I'm gonna ask you in the poll about. So take a look at the poll. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the ostrich effect, whether within your quality team or in the rest of the organization? So would it be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any neg negative impacts from this ostrich effect in your own team and in the organization as a whole? Please go ahead and vote. And uh, while we're waiting for you to vote on that question, um, if you have any questions uh, for us, I see some of you have already started submitting some. Uh, just click mouse down, click the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen there and send your questions via Q&A. Hey, Gleb, uh, did that poll launch OK? Because I'm not seeing any yeah, answers not, on my side. I'm not sure that that's uh, happening. Gillen, let me relaunch it. So maybe people aren't, you should be trying to answer. Yeah. There we go. Okay, good. There we go. Yeah, something. Zoom kind of technical issue messed up. Thank you, Dirk. Okay, we see that 70% of the people participated, so five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that, the, yes, this is an overwhelmingly yes. Everyone, literally everyone, sees that it would be valuable for you to within your own team and or within the larger organization as a whole, investigate and address the negative impacts of the ostrich effect. And you'll get resources to help you do so. But this is basically the idea is that you'll definitely want to bring this up to your leadership. If you're the quality leader, to the leadership of the whole organization. If you're not the quality leader in your organization, you probably want to bring it up to the quality leader themselves and then they can bring it up to the large, they can address it within the team. And of course, if you're the quality leader, you can address it within their team. And then the quality leader in your organization can bring it up to the rest of the leadership in the organization. So how do you deal with risk nihilism? Now you don't deal with it by stating facts and risks. You've probably seen that in your work, that that doesn't work. It just doesn't work well to bring up facts, to bring up risks, because people are dealing with an emotional block. If there's an obvious, clear issues. Now, of course, you can start by stating facts and risks, and but what will tend to happen, so this denialism, why it's happening, is that people are blinded to the, these risks. So for example, why do CEOs make bad decisions about their companies? Of, let's say, let's talk about Apple for a second. So let's pick an Apple. Yeah, it doesn't get larger than that. Huge company, many, many trillion. I think it's two, $2 trillion dollars worth. Now, what happened with Apple and the return to the office? Well, the Delta, Delta cases were surging already starting in early June. And Apple from the beginning was saying, we'll bring back our employees in September. September, September, September. That was the big thing. September was a date. And so cases were surging, employees were increasingly concerned about coming back during the Delta surge. They were pressing Apple on not bringing employees back to the office. And Apple was saying, no, no, we're bringing our employees back to the office. And there was increasing internal opposition in the Apple about that. And finally, on July 24th, Apple said, and this is when, by the way, if you remember July 24th, this is when things got incredibly bad by that time in Florida. It had the most cases it had throughout the pandemic many, many other places, huge rise in Delta cases. Delta was, is forecast, the Delta surge, to peak sometime in the late fall. And so Apple said, okay, September, yeah, that's not gonna work out. We're gonna bring back our people in October. <laughs> in October, <laughs> the great, that, that's the best you can come up with. You, you delayed by month into the heat of the Delta surge, according to all forecasts, right? Not very smart. And of course, that caused a lot of employees to be upset. A lot of employees increasingly started leaving Apple for other companies. And I know this from my internal sources at Apple, that if you really bad hits to morale, people kept pressing Apple. And just yesterday, Apple announced that, okay, you know, we screwed up. We're now going to delay from October into January, which is more reasonable, although still not great. But you can see that that's an example from July 24th to literally of the, a month. So it took a month for them to make a decision that's super obvious, that was really, really bad, and that a lot of employees left. They lost many, many, many very talented people. 
And of course, they changed their plans all over again. So Apple, several couple of trillion dollar companies, lost many billions of dollars as a result of this poor decision making. So this is an emotional block because leadership clearly really wanted to go back to the office. And there was an emotional block causing them to make bad decisions. So you want to fight emotional blocks. You don't give facts. You don't give statistics. That does not work out well. That's something that people don't respond to because they are feeling emotionally aroused. They're feeling defensive. Instead, you should use a technique called eager. So you, this is what it's about. You appeal to people's emotions. You understand first their emotions because there's an emotional block. So you need to understand those emotions. You find out their goals. You build rapport with those people. Then you give them information that contradicts their beliefs and assumptions. And then you provide them with some positive reinforcement. That's what it's about. So let's talk, let's go through each of these steps in turn through eager. So emotions. Now, emotions has to do with emotional intelligence within yourself. So what's emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is the skill of being able to understand and manage your emotions. And that's the fundamental basis for eager because you need to understand that your emotions are going to be, you're doing emotional labor here, meaning that you're managing and modulating your own emotions because the intuition, what your emotions are telling you to do is going with facts and going with arguments and talking about these risks, which are to you obvious and should be to an external observer that you know, <laughs> delaying it by a month from in July 24th to make a decision to the life from September to October is nonsense, but that's like any reasonable external observer, right? So you could see that the Apple leadership was in a mode of groupthink and not really being reasonable in any sort of way. You need to not say that. You can't come to Apple leadership and say, you're being totally unreasonable. You're completely making the wrong decisions. Yeah, you're just screwing up. I mean, <laughs> that is not going to give you the right reception. And you should not give them facts and say, here's the model saying that Delta is super obviously going to peak in mid late fall. Not a good idea to come back to the office in October. That's not what's going to res resonate with them. And that's, of course, not something that you're facing. So we'll talk about a case study for quality leadership that we'll go through. But just on the understanding the emotions is something that you have to understand. So these emotional intelligence is about you. You need to modulate your own emotions and then you need to show social intelligence. So social intelligence is the skill of understanding and influencing other people's emotions and relationships between you and that other person, between that other person and other people. So that's social intelligence. So this emotions has to do with your own emotional intelligence and your social intelligence. So you're doing emotional labor, you need to manage your emotions. Social intelligence, you need to influence other people. Understanding first. So when someone denies the facts, as we talked about, it's caused by an emotional block. So you need to understand their emotions. What are their emotions? You need to, and this is the skill of empathy, of course. So empathy is, has to do with understanding other people's emotions. You need to learn what other people are feeling. And that is, again, a learned skill, something that you can develop and practice over time. It's something that I've seen quality professionals not be intuitively good at because they tend to be more technically skilled, more technically oriented. And that's great that you're technically oriented. That's very important. That's what you need to do in the quality field, right? In order to succeed. But if you want to influence other people, and that's of course going to be increasingly important as you're going, moving up in your career as a quality professional, you know, if you want to be a team lead, if you want to be then the manager, the director, and then in interacting with people outside the quality field, it's really important to understand other people's emotions and which emotions are blocking them. It might be fear, it might be anger, it might be confusion, it might be righteousness. So other emotions, grief, loss, you know, I don't know what's, what was going on with the Apple the leadership that was causing them, but there might be feelings of defensiveness and feelings that, oh, you know, the, going back to the office is the right thing to do. So righteousness, so these sorts of things. So you need to figure out in each situation what's going on with the person. Then goals, you need to identify shared goals. What are the shared goals between you and the other person that might be impeded by the other person making bad decisions? So this goals, you know, we talk about other people, whether in the workplace, whether outside the workplace, we tend to focus on differences. But really, when you think about it, even the person with whom you're really mo most different at in the workplace, with whom you have the largest gap, 
maybe you you share about ninety five percent of the things I mean of your goal sets. You want you both want safety, you both want health, you both want a good family life, you want fun times and so on. And that's outside the workplace. You're sharing a lot of goals inside the workplace. You both want the company to do well, to function well. You want you don't want unnecessary conflict. You don't want lots of trouble, lots of problems. You both want the good things for the company as well. So you want to share and focus on those shared goals within the workplace. Of course, you want to focus on your shared goals within the workplace. Maybe you're doing a product launch and people in operations want to cut some corners. They're hurrying to meet a deadline. And you in quality are trying to say, okay, now it's a bad idea to cut these corners that will not work out well. You know, the product launch will be screwed up. But you are both sharing the goal of having a successful product launch. That's where you are starting from. And then there are some differences, but you want to look, look at the shared goals. So this is really important for you to then be able to share knowledge effectively. Report. What's that about? So we talked about tribalism. Tribalism meaning being within the same team, being on the same tribe. If you are in a positional ten tension with someone who is having a product launch, right? So let's say use that as an example. You're in quality, the people in operations want to launch a product. If there's a deadline, they want to cut some corners. They're feeling anxious or their emotions are anxiety, fear about not meeting this deadline. <laughs> They're clearly concerned about this topic. So you understand their emotions. You have shared goals of a successful product launch. Then you want to build up rapport. So rapport is where you show that you are in the same team, that you're in the same tribe. You remember that tribalism that's inbuilt in us. Right now, the position of the product launch is that quality and operations are in opposite tribes. Operations is in the tribe of, we need to make this deadline and we need to launch this product. Quality is in the tribe of, I don't care so much about the deadline, we need to make sure the product is quality. So that is an oppositional tribal perspective. And maybe quality is not, going to be penalized if the product is going to be launched later, but it's going to be penalized your incentives for quality if the product is bad. Whereas operations will be penalized if the product is launched later, but they're not going to be penalized if there are flaws in the product. That's an obvious bad incentive structure that puts you at opposite tribes. You want to share, you want to have that addressed. You want to make sure to put people on the same tribe. You want to talk to the operations people about, hey, we both want to have a successful product launch. You want to make sure the company is go succeeds. You know, maybe it will not be immediately penalized, but the whole company will be screwed if the product launch is bad, and then it will be it will hurt operations in the end, even if it won't immediately hurt you by the same way that you have a short term incentive of launching by the deadline. So you want to use empathetic listening to build the rapport. So hear them, you figured out, you, you guessed that their goals, that their emotions are is anxiety, but you want to talk about this. You want to say, okay, you know, so make sure that you hear them, that they feel heard. So it's kind of talking about, oh, I'm sure you feel anxious and worried about not making the deadline. Tell me more about how you're feeling about this topic. And I'm going to draw attention to what I'm saying about feeling. Not thinking, not saying, you know, don't only go into operations and tasks. Talk about how feelings, how they feel about a topic. Feeling is incredibly important. I'm, it's hard, you know, when I do this sort of presentation for quality professionals, lots and lots and lots of people miss out on the feelings that I'm emphasizing. And they think, okay, you know, just do the e-grip, goals, rapport, and so on. No, emotions is the foundational basis. So you want to look at people's emotions. You want to understand their emotions. Emotions drive about 80% of our behaviors when you look at the research on this topic. Not rational thinking, not logic, emotions. This is why it's so important for you to understand their emotions first and foremost. So figure out their emotions. And then you want to echo them saying, talk about how you understand their anxiety. It sounds really worrisome that you want to make it by the deadline. And if you don't, you know, there'll be penalties that you won't get your bonus. You will, you will, you know, there might be issues for your department. If you don't make it by the deadline, oh, that sounds really rough. 
that sounds very challenging. Totally understand how that's how that's going on. So you want to echo them and show them that they feel hurt. So you want to show them that you understand how they feel. Now, information. Here's where you provide new information that should cause them to change their mind. And again, now you're not coming out as someone who is just providing facts and risks and problems. You're coming as someone on their team, on their tribe, someone who is trusted with whom you established rapport, someone who shares their goals, and understands their emotions. You're now a trusted messenger, and you're now providing information in a way that is, from their perspective, is coming from their benefit. So really beneficial. It's like you've probably been hearing about all this vaccination trouble, that how it's a big, big problem to get people vaccinated and how many people are refusing vaccination. And when you look at studies of how do you get people to actually get, vac get vaccinated, overwhelmingly, the studies show that if the message is coming from a trusted messenger, that message will be heard much more than if it's coming from a distrusted messenger. So for example, studies show that communities like African-Americans are much more likely to be vaccinated if they're communicated with by an African-American influencer. If you can you see the same things about politics, people on the right tend to be less likely to be vaccinated. So if they hear Democrats talking about how you should get, become vaccinated, how you should get vaccinated, they are even less likely to become vaccinated. Now, if they hear Republicans, prominent Republicans talk about how you should be vaccinated, they are quite a bit more likely to become vaccinated. So that is what the trusted messenger is about. So you're becoming more of a trusted messenger here, and you're providing new information that challenges their beliefs. So again, talking about how, hey, you now these corners, maybe there are some corners that can be cut, and you, as a quality professional, you should probably know that there are some corners in the product launch that are just about paperwork or they're really minimally important and how other corners are really, really important to not cut and not the, fall into trouble. So talk about how, hey, totally understand that these, these couple of things not going to make much of a difference if we skip over them, if we minimize them. But these couple of things, you know, if we skip over them, then there's a serious threat of a product launch that will go amiss and would really, really hurt operations down the road. I mean, think about it. The company will be really hurt if the product launch doesn't work out. The next time you will not get the resources for a product launch. You know, maybe there'll be cut, maybe there'll be cuts in the company if the launch is bungled in the operations department. That's really bad. And you don't talk about what you want. You don't say, well, if the product launch is screwed up, then quality, we will take the blame. That's not what you want to talk about. You want to talk about them what they care about, and they care about operations. They don't care about you, and you have to understand that. So talk about what concerns them. So there, you want to be sensitive to their actual pain point that they're concerned about. They're concerned about this deadline, so that's what you want to be talking about, and the damage to them if they don't do the kind of things that you see as really being important. So that's the kind of conversations you want to be having. And then you want to provide positive reinforcement. So after the person changes their perspective, you want to provide positive reinforcement so that you don't have to have these conversations all the time, again, again, and again. So you want to provide them with positive reinforcement, say, hey, it's great that you shifted your perspective, that these, you know, we agreed that these corners you can cut, but these corners you really should not cut, and you're really going to stick to that. That's wonderful. You know, it's really tough to change your mind. Right now in American culture, it's a very, very problematic thing for people to be perceived as flip-floppers, for people to change their minds based on evidence. People are accused of being flip-floppers, not acu accused of being inconsistent, especially leaders. You know, when you see leaders who, are, who change their minds based on new information, they are really criticized. And that's a terrible, terrible thing for our culture, when leaders are criticized based on changing their minds. Because if they change their minds based on new evidence, as opposed to you know, going with the wind just because of popularity or something like that, if there's new evidence and it says, okay, and it causes them to change their mind, that is great. You want people to change their minds based on evidence. That's how logic and the rationality work. So you want people to shift their beliefs. And so you want to praise them for shifting their minds and say, you know, that people who talk about flip-floppers being bad or just don't know what they're talking about. It's wonderful to shift your beliefs based on evidence. That's what all of us should be doing, shifting our minds based on evidence. So that is something that you want to praise them for, shifting their minds based on evidence so that it helps shift their emotions to be more positively oriented 
toward changing their mind, toward changing their perspective. So that's the kind of things that you want to be thinking about. And that's what eGrip is about. And I talked through one case study. Let's talk about another case study, just so that you know how it applies in a different setting. And so I'm going to talk about a situation inside quality this time. So there was a situation that I faced myself with a quality professional. As Dirk mentioned, I published a book on returning to the called Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, Benchmarking to Best Practices for Competitive Advantage. And that was based on, by now, 16 organizations I helped strategically adapt to coming back to the office. And there was a, a situation where a quality professional with, with that business unit, he was really reluctant to have a hybrid schedule for his team and having some people who are going to be remote. So he wanted to have a situation where all people are brought back to the office for Monday for Friday, nine to five. And we're not talking about quality inspectors who have to be there. We're talking about 31 backend quality staff who worked fine, successfully, remotely throughout the pandemic. He wanted them back full time. Now, why is that? Well, he felt he wanted them, this is the right way to do things. This is the correct thing to do and that you can't have the best quality without them being back in the office. That that's the right way to do things. This is what, so he felt that sort of righteousness, that was his emotion. This is the right thing to do. This is the status quo. We need to go back to the status quo before the pandemic. That is the right way to collaborate. That is the, so he felt the strong sense of righteousness. He felt that, you know, quality professionals can't collaborate effectively with those in production and R&D without being their full time. So that was kind of a dynamic that he was concerned about. And of course, can't collaborate effectively with each other. Now, unfortunately, what he wasn't recognizing is the very serious danger to retention and recruitment. And especially in the case that he wants, the 31 backend staff who we're talking about here, that was in the case of the pandemic, this, this is a 1300 people manufacturing company that was ramping up for the post-pandemic recovery. So they needed to build up to about 50 people. And when you look at the research and the extensive surveys of what people want after the pandemic, you can very, very clearly see that people want the large amount of people, large proportion of people want hybrid and a substantial minority want fully remote. So of course, these are people who can work hybrid. We're not talking about the quality inspectors, we're talking about the backend step in this case. So something like only 15 to 25% want to go back to the office full time, which is what this quality leader wanted. Something like 50 to 60% want, or maybe something like 65% want hybrid schedules of one to three days in the office, preferably closer to one to two days and something like 25 to 35% of the people want full-time remote. So this is going to be quite problematic for him to have these people <laughs> and especially to retain these people because the great resignation is happening. People are leaving right and left for more opportunities and especially recruiting up to 50 people. That's a big problem. So there's a cognitive bias here called the status quo bias where people tend to want to go back to the, what they perceive as the right status quo. So that's a status quo bias. And that was something that the quality leader was clearly falling into, making serious mistakes because of this status quo bias. He felt that the right way to work is January, 2020. And he didn't really recognize he was blind to, he had a serious emotional block about the major fundamental disruption caused by the pandemic. The pandemic has caused fundamental shifts in people's beliefs about the right way to work. And even right now, with them, <laughs> this is something that people, even after the vaccination, by the way, this was not happening during the Delta surge. This was happening around May when vaccination was clearly being available and the Delta surge has not happened yet. So this is before the Delta surge. So this is something that just didn't realize and didn't recognize. This was a problem. So I talked about, I used the eGrip model to convince him because I clearly saw that he was being blinded to the fact. So I empathized with him on his goals of having a good culture, collaborating effectively, making sure to do the best quality. Clearly, that's his goal. And I understood his emotions. We already talked about them. This feeling of righteousness. This is the right way to work. And sort of anxiety about not having people back in the office. He's a pretty gregarious guy. Not that typical for, well, more typical for quality leaders who rise up in the ranks. 
They tend to be more extroverted. He liked being surrounded by people. He felt that's the right thing to do. And he felt that that promotes accountability and so on. So we talked, so clearly that's the emotions. This goal was to have a good culture and to retain and recruit people, of course, to get up that 50 level, collaborate effectively, make sure to have good quality. So report, building a rapport about those sorts of issues. So understood his goals, talked about how this is super important. This is clearly important. Let's talk about how to establish that. Now, here is the fourth step of providing information. So we went for the emotions, went for the goals, we went for the rapport. What about information? The fourth step. I talked about, I highlighted two things that were, you know, risk that he was denying in, to, in terms of risks. How he really won't succeed in his goal of having a good culture, good collaboration, and good quality if he struggles with staff retention and recruitment. Because that was definitely an issue. And the, you, you could see that staff were not happy about uh, the 31 backend staff were not happy about his desire to go back to the office. And this was in May. So this was clearly going to be an issue of retention, the recruitment, that was being a challenge. And this was in the context of the great resignation where people were leaving. And I was highlighting this sort of pretty clear evidence. And second, what I saw and what I talked to him about is that from my interviews with people in the company, with the quality staff, there were some aspects of the quality management software that they had that they weren't really using very effectively. They were just using it in the same way that they were using it back in the office in January 2020. They really haven't strategically adapted to the pandemic. So he was having this mentality, which is called functional fixedness. That's another cognitive bias. So functional fixedness, where when you have one way of working, collaborating, then you transpose that way of working and collaborating on all sorts of other areas. So they had one way of working in the office, and then he transposed that, and the whole team transposed that, but with him as the leader, to working in virtually throughout the pandemic. So that's a big, big problem, that they didn't strategically draft their quality management software to working effectively during the pandemic. That was another issue. Now, and when I highlighted that too and talked about how he can make it, things work better than they currently are and make sure that the retention and recruitment don't suffer. So yeah, so that eventually he shifted somewhat and he was willing to have at least a hybrid schedule. And for most people who were full-time remote, the 31 backend people, and then if they really wanted and if they really were really, really wanted that he would leave, let them do full virtual. And that was very good when the Delta surge came. So remember, this was back in May when the Delta surge was coming in July. That was very helpful because people can go back to full-time remote and it wasn't kind of like they weren't all back in the office and they didn't have to have a disruption. So he was quite grateful for that. So there was positive reinforcement around that. We talked about how it was good, how it had this good outcome and how it was beneficial for him. So that's a way that is not, so I talked about one way of quality to other stakeholders, and I talked about one way of using eGrip e within quality. Let's have a poll of whether you think it would be valuable for you and your team to use eGrip to address risk denialism, both within your own team and outside, both within the quality area with your own team and outside the quality team. And once again, uh, we do have questions coming in. Um, so continue to uh, continue to send those. Uh, that's just in case you didn't hear me, it's the Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. Click that, send us your questions, and we will get to them uh, when Gleb is done with his presentation. We'll get to as many of them as we can, I should say, when Gleb is done with his presentation. Five more seconds for folks to make their voice heard. All right, so it seems very, very popular that 98% of you think that eGrip would be a good technique. Good, you'll get resources after the presentation that you can use then to spread the word about eGrip, learn it yourself and spread the word about eGrip for your company. Good. All right, so coming to the key takeaways that you should be thinking about after this presentation. So you, oh, <laughs> let me go through the key takeaways. Overconfidence bias and ostrich effect lead to risk nihilism. So we talked about the overconfidence bias, 80% of you being in the top half, only 20% of you being in the bottom half, all drivers. 
And that, of course, applies to, especially to people with expertise and authority. So be careful about that. And the ostrich effect, all that combination and the confirmation bias, of course, all of these cognitive biases, but especially I want to highlight the overconfidence bias and ostrich effect leading to risk denialism. And this to risk denialism, it comes from negative emotions. We're not wired for the modern environment. Our gut intuitions, our emotions, our feelings are not wired for the modern environment. They're wired for the savannah environment. And this causes us serious trouble in the modern environment. So we need to be aware of that and address that internally within us through emotional intelligence. And of course, the same thing through others, through social intelligence. And that is where you address your own emotions and other people's emotions. So emotional intelligence for your own emotions, social intelligence for other people's emotions. And you want to use eGrip to address risk nihilism by others. Emotions, goals, rapport, information, and positive reinforcement. And on that note, here are going to be some free additional resources that you can opt into. So a white paper on why do smart people ignore serious risks in the post-COVID recovery and what to do about it. So this white paper on the topic of this presentation and a digital copy of my best-selling book on addressing cognitive biases. The Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And finally, a free coaching session for the first three claimants. So what I'll do is after I get the list of of opt-in folks, I will send everyone a link with a coaching session. So for the resources, there'll be a link and you can click on that link. And if it's available for you to sign up then the coaching session is still available. All right, and here is going to be the same thing, the resources. So please go ahead and vote on whether you would like the resources. In the meantime, I will start looking at the questions and answering them. All right, so um, what well, people are answering that one. And then when that one's done, we got one, one other poll. Uh, remind me to put that up, Gleb. When, sure. Uh, we're done. Um, sorry, let me get these up here. Um, okay, so Gleb, um, this question, actually, I was kind of thinking at the same time, is it sounded like a lot of what you were talking about, eGrip, is something that we've got to do I guess on a personal basis, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's as an individual, we've got to develop emotional intelligence and, yes. and so forth. So this question is, so now that we know about the presence and impact of bias, how can we integrate that into our organizational thinking? Mm -hmm. Can you transfer these ideas that you've just talked about, which seem very personal to me, can you somehow translate those into an organizational structure? Oh, yes, of course, you can translate those pretty easily. So one thing is to educate people about overconfidence bias, ostrich effect, and uh, confirmation bias. You want that to be something that people are aware of. You want that to be part of the conversation. So the, this has to be something that people can choose to understand and say, okay, you know, is there, so when I do this, do consulting for organizations, and including the 16 organizations that I talked about strategically adapting back to the office and other topics, it becomes a topic of conversation, becomes something, okay, have we checked for the ostrich effect? Might we be denying some risks here? What about the overconfidence bias? Are we denying some risks here? So that is something that people can just make a system, a process, including in their information management. So as part of your information management, as part of your quality process information management, that is a checkbox to check off. And don't mean you know, simply a checkbox, a check mark, but something that you discuss and evaluate. Might that be a presence here? Might this be a problem? Now, of course, eGrip is a distinct sort of thing. You, that's for you to persuade others. But the cognitive biases are easily in, integrated into information management and quality management processes within an organization. Okay. Um, actually, uh, why don't we, uh, can we end this poll right now, Gleb? Uh, let's give people 10 more, so, uh, 10 okay. more seconds so, for those who didn't do it, and then we'll end it. So 10 more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Please go ahead. All right. and vote. Uh, meanwhile, I'll throw another question at you. Uh, yeah. I'm going to shorten this one up a little bit. Um, we are consistently in need of more staff to provide the high level of service expected. However, top execs expect us to do more with less staff. Mm -hmm. We have hit the limit of more with less, mm. and not only a service a risk, but now turnover is a risk. What can I do to convince our execs of the ripple effect of additional future risks if we don't address the present risk? What you want to focus on, and uh, 
in this case, and by the way, after I end this question, we're going to put up a new poll, so make sure to vote if you didn't yet. What you want to do in this sort of situation is have stories. And why is that? Well, clearly the people aren't, deny, aren't responding to the facts. And you're probably sharing facts. You're talking about, here are the facts. You know, we, we are the limit of what we can do more with less. Here is the statistics. Here's the situation. You don't want to focus on facts more because it's not uh, persuading people. So you want to understand what's going on here with them. So try to understand their emotions. Are they feeling that quality is not very important? That might be one consideration. So they might feel that, well, we need to cut something, you know, quality, whatever. It, it, it's not so important. Quality is a loss center, right? That's kind of how people perceive quality, unfortunately, wrongly, but that's how people perceive quality. So you want to understand their emotions and what, how are they feeling about quality? Why is it that quality is the area that is not getting the resources that it needs Presumably, other areas are getting more resources. So that's the first thing to understand what's going on here. And then you want to address the underlying pain points that are their concerns and talk about, hey, so here we're clearly seeing a situation that you are seeing and you're not telling them that. You're seeing a situation where they're perceiving quality is not important. That means that you probably want to highlight the importance of quality. So let's say with a product launch, right? Talk about, you know, we're doing more with less and that is... A concern, you know, well, so here's an example of what happens when we have less quality, when we are have to do more with less. Give a story, share an example, and say, here's a situation where clients are upset because the quality was not met. Or if it didn't happen yet, have a perspective. Here is what will happen when the quality is cut and when quality doesn't get the resources it needs. And here's how it impacts the business case. Here is how clients are upset. Next time they will not order from us. And next time that's how the organization loses money because quality is not met. So you want to have that work from what they care about because they don't, clearly they don't care about quality, right? <laughs> that is not their concern. Their concern is the bottom line. And that is, a, you want to uh, highlight how quality is going to impact the bottom line. And you don't want to highlight that for data and statistics. You want to highlight that for surveys, for stories, of what will happen. And that's the kind of information you want to share with people who are the top levels because they really think, they tend to think more in stories if they already don't see the, the benefits of quality. There are two types of leaders. Some people, some leaders are really more data-driven, data-oriented, and some people are more vision, inspiration, story, narrative-oriented. You'll likely have a little bit more of the story, narrative-oriented people at the company if they already don't see the importance of quality. So that's what I would do in your sort of in your situation. Okay, and we're ending the poll and we're putting up the new poll. All right. And while you're doing that, um... and this is for intellects, the sponsors of this presentation. So if you want exactly. to resources from them, mm -hmm. okay, that went up there for a little bit. Uh, okay, so. Uh, okay, this question, I think, goes back to the very beginning uh, when you were talking about board members that were fired. Um, so uh, the question is, why are you assuming that the board members were correct and that the top leader who was fired was, was wrong uh, because mm -hmm. of denial? Mm -hmm. And then I guess flipping, so flipping this on the head, what if the top leader was right? And I guess by implication, the board was wrong. Is there some sort of bias that comes in, is coming into play there? I don't know about the motivations of the board. This is a study that was done not by me, that was done by an external source that looked at why leaders are fired. So okay. that's just the, the reasoning. And the reasoning, of course, comes from board members because the board members are the ones responsible for hiring and firing the executive, the top executive, the CEO. And so when we see that board members who are responsible for hiring and firing the top executive, by the way, you know, they're not uh, eager to fire their top executives. Sure. This is not, uh, this means that the board was wrong in hiring the top executive in the first place and boards generally don't like to admit that. So they have to have some serious reason for firing this person. And when they talk about the reasons for firing this person, the one of the top reasons, 23% named denialism of risk, that should, show, that, that should tell you that really risk denialism is a serious problem at the top levels. And I gave you an example of Apple. You know, it doesn't really get more higher than that. There aren't 
any companies that are really larger than Apple in any significant way, you know, Apple, Google, whatever. So Apple, $2 trillion company, seriously wrong decision-making. We can clearly see that very obvious and we can all see that. So that's uh, an example of where risk blindness causes serious problems. This, um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering because it's actually, since I've heard other talks of yours, as a, can you have a group denialism effect and i guess sure. maybe it's, it's called, called cons uh, yeah. consensus so, effect or, or yeah. bias so or something the, like the, talk about the, that a little bit where sure. where it's not just one person who's emotionally involved but you have a large group of people that are maybe going in the wrong direction because of some sort of group bias oh, absolutely yeah this is called groupthink where people align their opinions around the most popular idea in the group or and or the top leader in the group, the alpha person. And so they align their opinions and they ignore negative information about external reality. And in this case, of course, is the, not simply Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, but the top leadership of Apple, the C-suite and so on, presumably the board who were very much denying negative reality about the situation. And so we, this is called groupthink, alignment of these opinions. And this is one of those things that you really want to be aware of and address within any organization. It often happens because there's discouragement of people who, are, who share negative information about the reality within the group. So in order to address groupthink within any sort of organization, what you need to do is praise devil's advocates, create a position of devil's advocates, at least two for any team, and give them support and encouragement of sharing negative information it goes against the group consensus. So have that be an official role. And that will definitely help you address groupthink within any organization. Okay. Um, Oh, wait, I've got time for got time for one more here. Oh, one second here. Sure. Get my questions organized. Uh, oh, okay. So this this one's more from a personal perspective. What are some ways that I can incorporate this approach into my everyday work life? So what I think is really important for incorporating this approach is to focus on your emotions. Most people, most quality professionals are not as emotionally intelligent as they should be, meaning that they're not as aware of their emotions and as able to manage them. And that's the foundational basis of all of this stuff that we're talking about. You need to have emotional intelligence to recognize when you're overconfident and when you might be not in the top half all drivers. You need to have emotional intelligence to realize when you're denying reality. I need to have a lot of emotional intelligence when you're going through eGRIP because you're doing the emotional labor here. You're being the emotional adult in the room and it doesn't feel good. <laughs> it feels good to share, to argue, to share facts, to have that sort of interaction. It does not feel good to have a sort of understanding of the other person, try to understand their emotions and care about their emotions, figure out their goals, you know, share goals, build rapport, only then share information and then strategically end with positive reinforcement. So you need to have a basis of emotional intelligence for yourself. And my resources that I'll send you to talk about that. And then the next step is that develop that social intelligence, the ability to understand other people's emotions and influence other people's emotions. So that, those would be the things that I would strongly encourage you to use. That emotional intelligence first for yourself, use that as a basis, and then develop your social intelligence when you're orienting toward other people. Okay, um, well, that is uh, it. We're at the top of the hour here. Um, uh, we have some more other questions. Don't worry, I will forward those questions on to Gleb. So if we didn't get to them here uh, during the webinar, uh, Gleb will see them and uh, I'm, I'm assuming he will answer you offline sure. on yes. those. And also uh, because, there's uh, that coaching session available for folks who want that. Perfect. Uh, okay, Gleb, well, once again, thanks for an interesting webinar. Uh, I always like listening to you. Um, Thanks again to all of you for joining us. Um, you will be receiving an email with a link uh, to a recording of this webinar from Quality Digest. So if you want to watch it again, or you missed part of it, or you want to share it with your friends, you'll be able to do that. So keep your eyes open for that email. It'll come out at about this same time tomorrow, usually 24 hours later. Um, and uh, you can use that. So from all of us here at Quality Digest and Intellex, have a great day. And we will see you at the next webinar. So long.